Uh, so I welcome uh, 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 Eddie's uh, application to join us and uh, look forward to hearing what he has to say. And Eddie, I'll turn it over to you because I can just blather forever. <laughs> well, thanks, Mark. And uh, good afternoon or morning or whatever time zone you're in. Um, uh, thanks, thanks for coming. Uh, I'll just say a little bit about myself briefly. Um, I was trained as a, a nuclear astrophysicist, uh, but in the in the nuclear, I actually have my degree is in nuclear physics. Um, and uh, uh, I jumped around. I was in Tucson for my first postdoc, Stony Brook for my second. And then I spent 33 years on the faculty at, at Oklahoma, um, uh, but I uh, left that uh, a few months ago. And uh, but still continuing to be very active. Uh, and uh, um, as Mark said, this is probably a little somewhat unusual uh, uh, topic area uh, for, for this audience, but uh, hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll, you'll see that there may be quite a few areas uh, of, of overlap um, uh, uh, with your own work. Um, so let me just start this very pretty uh, HST image uh, of this galaxy, uh, NGC 6946. Um, uh, it's from a paper by my uh, collaborator, led by my collaborator, Melissa Chavande. Uh, and you can see that this, this galaxy, this pretty spiral galaxy, hosted recently uh, two uh, type two supernova, 17 EAW and O4 ET. And um, it's not surprising that, you know, beautiful spirals like this make massive stars that core collapse and make supernovas. Um, uh, so my outline, uh, this talk is a little bit disjointed because I wanted to uh, uh, really talk about uh, all three uh, topics that I'm actively working on. Uh, so I'll start off with a little bit of Supernova 101, uh, what's a core collapse versus a thermonuclear, and uh, what are the currently popular main explosion uh, scenarios. And then I'll move on to the three different projects uh, uh, that I'm involved in. Uh, POISE, uh, which uh, seeks to obtain early optical and near-infrared photometry and spectra of all supernova types. Uh, Mir snack, which uh, is space-based, particularly focused on JWST, obtaining near-infrared and mid-infrared spectroscopy of late phases of all supernova types. And then Phoenix, uh, which is a generalized stellar atmosphere code, um, and uh, it produces synthetic spectra of stars, supernova, planets, even done some AGN. So why do we care about supernova? Well, uh, as you all probably know that type 1a supernova have been used for pre precision cosmology. And in fact, in 1999, two somewhat independent teams uh, uh, used type 1a supernova to discover the dark energy for which three of them won the Nobel Prize in, in 2011. But for my background coming from a stellar revolution uh, perspective, um, it really, they really provide us with a means of test testing and falsifying our understanding of stellar evolution. Um, you know, what stars, you know, sort of my research program could be summarized as what stars produce what supernova? And uh, it's, a, it's a tough question. Um, and, uh, of course, stars are in binaries, uh, and uh, so, and in particular, uh, many of the types of supernova probably require binary stellar evolution. So this really gives us really handle on on something that we don't understand all that in all that much detail. So it really will give us information about binary stellar evolution. And then, of course, supernova. Thankfully, stars blow up <laughs> and they uh, expel all the stuff they make into the interstellar medium. So, you know, there's carbon and oxygen and silicon available for 
us to make life and stand on planets and uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, uh, they also form uh, are the production sites or one of the production sites of molecules and, and dust. So supernova are, you know, uh, there's, there's quite a zoo of them and I won't go into detail uh, with all of these, but uh, the basic classification scheme of supernova is spectroscopic. Uh, and it's just simply a question, do you have hydrogen? If you have hydrogen, then you're type two. And if you don't have hydrogen, you're type one. Um, but one can ask the further question, do you have a strong uh, uh, silicon lines, particularly uh, uh, around uh, 6355 or observed 6100 angstroms? And if you do, then you're type one A and that's a special kind of supernova. It's a thermonuclear explosion where all of this other complexity here uh, comes from the collapse of massive stars, um, but from a variety of different progenitors. And so let's let's follow that breakup between uh, uh, thermonuclear versus core collapse. Uh, and uh, the community doesn't agree on, on the progenitors and mechanisms, and these projects that I'm going to describe seek to obtain the answers to those, or at least provide um, more information. But um, we do know, we do understand, saying that we don't really understand supernova, which I sometimes say, uh, um, is, is too strong, uh, uh, because we know that type 1a supernova are the thermonuclear explosion of a carbon and oxygen white dwarf. Uh, and uh, we know that um, uh, the explosion uh, is uh, uh, created by burning carbon and oxygen uh, uh, to iron group elements. And in fact, primary to nickel 56, uh, because the explosion of the white dwarf is powered by fusion, the strong force, but the actual supernova display is powered by the radioactive decay of nickel-56. If there was no radioactive decay of nickel-56, we wouldn't see much uh, uh, of a supernova display from a thermonuclear supernova. And we know, of course, this white dwarf has to be in a binary because an isolated white dwarf, isolated carbon oxygen white dwarf will just hang out and cool forever. Uh, so the only way to get it to do something is to dump mass on top, onto it. Um, and that's where the questions come because we don't know exactly, we don't know what the companion is exactly. Uh, we don't know the details of the mass transfer. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the explosion mechanisms that are currently popular explosion mechanisms. And then the other kind of supernova is core collapse. And that's sort of more straightforward because we know that massive stars, stars that can uh, burn, uh, ignite carbon burning. Eddie? Uh, yeah. Uh, if I could just uh, a quick question here on the uh, type one uh, stuff that, that uh, but we but we know that there are binaries out there in which there's mass transfer going on. I was mentioning Cygnus X1 as, as a case, so it's the, the black hole instead of a white dwarf, but we detect the X-rays from the system knowing that it's, you know, the stuff is spiraling in. But the, there are other systems like that that maybe have white dwarf companions uh, to like, a you know, bee giant or something that that uh, are are known. Are, are, I mean, are, are systems known? Oh, yeah. I mean, systems are known. It's just not agreed upon. You know, the, the old idea was is that, well, it's a white dwarf with a red giant companion and the red giant is, you know, uh, it has expanded its Roche lobe and is just dumping material onto it. That simple picture is no, <laughs> it's, it's no, is no longer so simple. But no, certainly there are uh, uh, um, uh, identified systems. It's just not agreed upon what the typical type 1A supernova uh, what it's what its progenitor system is that's that's not that is not known i cannot tell you that uh -huh. okay and, and these systems also 
they they don't tell you that they're going to blow up anytime soon. You, know, you don't get any advance. Uh, there's no advance uh, warning that that you might be able to pick up. No, for a while we thought that super soft X-ray sources would be, you know, would be our advance warning, but that that hasn't panned out. So, so no, there really isn't. Um, okay. Thank. Uh, so, yeah. So turning to core collapse, we know that you know any star more massive than about eight solar masses, which means it's has enough mass or high enough temperatures to ignite carbon burning, just due to the nuclear physics will burn all the way to iron and you don't burn iron because it's exothermic, it costs energy. So the star is gonna build up this onion skin structure uh, with a iron white dwarf sitting in the center of it. And like all white dwarfs, iron white dwarfs have a Chandrasekhar mass. Uh, and uh, since there's, um, a silicon shell outside that's dumping iron on, right on top of it, it's got very efficient accretion. Uh, so uh, uh, the iron uh, white dwarf mass is going to grow and it's going to exceed the Chandrasekhar limit and it's going to collapse. And nothing can halt that collapse until it reaches nuclear matter density. And then uh, it will overshoot nuclear matter density by a bit, rebound, and a shock wave is initiated sort of about halfway. Uh, um, uh, in the uh, um, through the iron white dwarf, so about seven tenths of a solar mass, if you think about it. Um, and that's actually a problem because um, the shock wave, as it traverses that other seven tenths of a solar mass of iron, it's very energetically expensive uh, um, because the shock wave dissociates the iron all the way back to free neutrons and protons. So you can think of that the shock wave uh, actually reverses uh, the 100 million years of stellar evolution that has occurred uh, um, in a few hundred milliseconds. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it costs about 10 to the 51 ergs for every tenth of a solar mass of iron the shock wave traverses, and it just runs out of steam. Now the shock wave doesn't go away because shock's jobs is to conserve energy and momentum and it still has to conserve energy and momentum. It just doesn't move outward uh, uh, and start to uh, create positive velocities in order to eject the outer parts of the star and, and produce the actual supernova. Uh, so if the shock wave just sat there, you just have a direct collapse to a black hole, which probably does occur sometimes, but we want it to uh, produce a neutron star and a supernova display. So let me now turn a little bit to the explosion mechanisms. So now I'm going back to thermonuclear. So this is a white dwarf. Um, and uh, this is the sort of more, except, well, let's say it's the more older scenario. Uh, that is, is that, you know, we've used type 1a for precision cosmology because we at least have an empirical relationship uh, uh, between their uh, observational characteristics, the shape of the light curve and uh, how bright they are intrinsically. And we've known also that, you know, they're pretty standard bombs. So original idea was is that, well, okay, let, let's make them all the same mass, a uh, standard mass, um, and blow them up. Well, again, that, that very simplest thing is just, just detonate a Chandra mass carbon oxygen white dwarf doesn't produce a type 1a supernova. It actually produces exactly two elements, nickel 56. Okay, great. We needed that, but in helium. So no intermediate mass elements, no silicon. In particular, you need silicon to be a thermonuclear uh, uh, type 1a. Um, and so what it was realized is that, well, gee, you either have to burn subsonically, um, and so that's a so-called deflagration, uh, in order to produce the nucleosynthetic products that we want. But this is a simulation. This is from a paper by Ivo Seitzendahl. Um, and it shows that that burning, that subsonic burning, 
is really messy. Yeah, it's extremely turbulent and ash and fuel are mixed. And that's not what we see in type 1a supernova. We see these really quite cellular nucleosynthetic uh, products. Uh, and uh, so this sort of needs to be cleaned up. On the other hand, we need this subsonic deflagration because, like I said, if you just detonate a carbon oxygen gender sacred white dwarf, it gives you the wrong thing. It's also hard to do, it turns out. Um, and so the subsonic de deflagration, it's quite subsonic. It moves at, you know, about a hundredth of the speed of sound. So there's plenty of time for pressure waves to go out and say, hey, you know, it's getting hot in the inside. You should expand. So this whole white dwarf has plenty of time to react uh, to the deflagration burning. And then the idea that came in the 90s was is that, well, that deflagration will transition into a detonation. And that detonation um, explodes the star, uh, but it also cleans things up because the shock wave goes in both in and out. Um, uh, and uh, going inside it uh, completes the burning. And so any ash, that, any fuel that's left in those uh, very, very messy, um, uh, turbulent uh, flows is, is all cleaned up by the shock wave. And so we get this cellular um, nucleosynthesis. The other popular model is, hey, well, actually, if you look at type 1a supernova, they aren't all the same. Uh, they're individuals. And it's like, well, you know, we said, hey, we want Shander Sekar mass to make them all the same. Hey, let's use, let's tune the mass and go to sub Shander Sekar uh, uh, progenitors, white dwarfs. Um, and then we can, you know, dial in the mass that we want. Um, and the other nice thing about sub Chandrasekhar white dwarfs is of course, because uh, they have this inverse, uh, uh, white dwarfs have an inverse mass radius relation. Sub Chandrasekhar mass white dwarfs are big and puffy, larger radii than Chandrasekhar mass white dwarfs. So their central densities are lower. And so if you can, if you detonate a sub Chandra white dwarf, that's fine because that's essentially what the, the whole idea of the delayed detonation scenario is, is to you know have a deflagration that expands the Chandra sacred mass white dwarf and then you detonate it when it reaches the right density. Here, you just start at the right density, detonate it. So the way that uh, this works is, is that you build up a small, um, uh, from a companion, a small amount of helium and quite small shells, a uh, few hundredths of a solar mass. Uh, it's degenerate, the helium is uh, degenerate, and then eventually it ignites. Uh, and when you ignite stuff degeneratively, it detonates. So the helium on the surface detonates. That small shell is blown off, but it drives a shock wave, a compressional wave inward, which ignites carbon burning at the center and it detonates. Uh, so these two models are both viable. And as far as we know, some type 1a supernova may come from one and some type 1a supernova may come from the other. And the question is, is okay, what's, what's the population? So then turning back to core collapse, there's a pretty well agreed upon scenario in the community. Um, and that's the neutrino driven explosion. And this is from a paper by Thomas Yonka. Uh, and the idea is, is that uh, the iron core collapses, the shock stalls, but then that iron, that thing that's at nuclear matter density, it's not a neutron star yet. Um, in the first few hundred milliseconds, uh, there isn't enough time for the protons and electrons that existed in the, in the iron white dwarf to 
turn into neutrons. Uh, and, uh, and of course, when they turn into neutrons, neutrinos are emitted. And in fact, most of the energy of the, uh, of the collapse, uh, 10 to the 53 ergs, comes out in the form of neutrinos. And the idea is that you have this uh, stalled shock and the neutrinos come out and some of them deposit their energy behind the shock, increase the temperature and pressure, and send the shock on its way. Now, there are more complicated uh, uh, scenarios uh, uh, that involve rotation and magnetic fields, but this is, this is the most commonly uh, agreed upon scenario. Well, we've been studying supernova for a long time, uh, but you know, sort of seriously, uh, since the you know '80s, uh, let's say, uh, and basically, you know, supernova are rare phenomena, and uh, we've been you know we've been looking for our key under the lamppost, but not that's that's a little oversimplification. We've been looking near maximum light when our supernova are brightest. And that actually makes sense because they're rare phenomena. We want to build up samples of them. So we want to, you know, see them uh, uh, at the largest volume. So, you know, look at them when they're brightest. But we, like I say, we've been doing that over the last 30 or 40 years and we've learned a lot. And so it's the time now is to move away from the lamppost. So the frontier is really at early and late times. And the first uh, project that I'm gonna talk about, Poise focus is, is early times, which I'll define in, in a second. Uh, so the real thing that is new now is that we have these all sky surveys uh, functioning our Atlas and ZTF, but scheduled to come online next year is the Vera Rubin telescope. And then we also have machine learning brokers that can go, you know, look at the output from these surveys and say, hey, this thing's bright, getting bright, go look at it. And the particular one that we use is Alerse, but there are others. So POIS, which stands for Precision Observations of Infant Supernova Explosions, um, uh, consists of 32 collaborators at 16 institutions on three continents. Um, uh, the lead institution is uh, the Carnegie Observatories, Santa Barbara Street, Santa Barbara, uh, in Pasadena, uh, wrong, wrong California town. And our, our leader is uh, Chris Burns. Uh, but really, police couldn't function without uh, Nydia Morell, who uh, um, basically uh, if we'd let her, she would observe, uh, go, go to the telescope and do all the observing. And uh, uh, it just so happens that there was a lovely piece uh, with a great picture uh, uh, of Nydia uh, in the New York Times yesterday. Uh, um. So what do I mean by early versus late? Uh, um, so obviously, the dividing line is maximum light. So pre-max is early and Postmax is late, but but um, really, when we talk about early times, we really want to see the outermost layers and environmental effects. So we're really trying to look at one or less than one day to around five, ten days post explosion, depending on what particular object. And then late times, we want to. I want to define as when the Ejecta is nearly transparent. And again, the exact date depends on the object, but it's more like 100 days past max. Uh, um, so basically, you can see through most or all of the ejecta, so you can probe the entire ejecta. So for poise, our main resource is time on the one meter swope telescope, which is owned by uh, Carnegie Observatories and is at Los Campanas in, in, in Chile. Uh, and the thing that we have on our competitors in this, in this field is that POIS is really sort of the third incarnation of 
what was originally called the Carnegie Supernova Project. Uh, and uh, the first two, CSP1 and CSP2, were focused on doing cosmology. Uh, and uh, so the photometry uh, of the swope is extremely well characterized. And what that means is, is that our colors, which are important, are really precise. And we think they're more, pre more precise than those of our competitors. So uh, we're looking to do sort of 20 week, four week per year campaigns, uh, getting nightly cadence in six filters, UBV, GRI, uh, spectroscopic follow-up, uh, on resources around the world, including big telescopes, Magellan, GTC, Keck. And the other sort of unique thing about POISE is that it's a really tight collaboration between observers and theorists, um, uh, which is good for me since I'm a theorist. <laughs> so what, what questions can POISE answer? Well, what is the progenitor? Uh, like I said, we know that it, in type 1As or thermonuclear explosions, we know that there's at least one white dwarf in a binary, but what's the companion? Uh, in type 2s, uh, since 87A, uh, where we knew the progenitor because it was uh, you know, in a pretty bright region of the LMC, uh, so it had been previously observed, uh, then with HST, uh, you can go back to HST archives and say, hey, what, you know, what's the progenitor? So we started to build up uh, some understanding of what the progenitor, what the mass of the progenitor is. And the results are that, well, type twos don't seem to come from stars that are more massive than about 17 solar masses. And that's known as the red supergiant problem. And it really is sort of a problem because theory predicts that, yeah, that there shouldn't really be a cutoff around 17. If there's going to be a cutoff to, say, direct collapse to uh, black holes, it should be at higher masses, 25 or so. And then type 1bc, these are type, if you're a 1, remember, you don't have hydrogen. So you've lost your hydrogen, maybe helium envelope. So does that occur through winds from a single star or binary evolution or some combination of both? And then what is the environment? You know, in, in one A's, you have mass transfer in a binary system. So maybe you have a really messy circumstellar medium, or you might have a really hot accretion disk that blows a wind and creates a pretty well evacuated cavity. You really don't know. Um, in type twos, there's been a fair amount of evidence for high mass loss just before the explosions, like a thousand years before the explosions. And uh, there are some uh, Canada explanations, but it, it's not well understood in, in stellar evolution theory. And then type one BCs provide clues about wolf a winds and binary mass loss. And then, like I said, the explosion mechanism for all supernova is not, the details are not well understood. So uh, we have a, Boyce has a NSF proposal under review, and this is our version of a science traceability matrix for type 1As. And I'm not gonna go through this. I just wanna show you that we really do have, you know, a set of observables uh, that can go back and, and uh, 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 trace to, key physical parameters and, and science objectives. And the same is true for core collapse. And uh, because, you know, I showed you that diagram with where core collapse are much more, there's much more collapse complexity in, in the core collapse zoo, uh, the science traceability matrix is, is a bit more complicated and larger. So poise actually, uh, We've had five campaigns. Um, fifth one ended yesterday morning. Um, uh, and we started rather in auspiciously uh, in March of 2020. Uh, we had two nights on the Swope telescope. And of course, 
we were shut down by the COVID-19 pandemic, but it showed that we could actually do it. And so we carried on 2021A, 2021B, 2022A, 2022B, and 2023A, which, like I said, just finished yesterday morning. But we have this collaborative NSF proposal under review. So that is funded, fingers crossed, uh, six more semesters. So just some preliminary results. Um, back pre-poise, uh, back in the CSP era, uh, we made this, this diagram uh, that I call the red versus blue diagram. So this is color versus time versus days after discovery. Uh, and that should be correlated uh, for these particularly early objects with days after explosion. Uh, I can't turn, I can't tell you the the function that turns discovery into explosion, but hope that that there's not too far apart. Um, and uh, what the original diagram showed was this, and that we interpreted as a real dichotomy that there were some objects that started out quite red and then sort of converged to being normal blue. And then another set of objects that um, started out blue and just stayed blue. And this may be that, you know, okay, that these red objects are helium detonations and these blue objects are uh, near Chandra Seca or mass progenitors. Um, we can't say we don't have enough information to say that yet, but we're building up this sample. And then uh, here we show our light curve. So the star is discovery. Um, and here is non-detections. Um, and then the dash blue line shows when we obtain an optical spectrum and red lines are near infrared spectra. And you can see our, our light curves are pretty nice. They're great. Uh, and then the spectra uh, are over here for three different kinds of objects. So this one's a 1A. And this is since, to, since last non-detection. That's what the, this phase is, 1.8 days since last non-detection. So again, we think that that should be pretty close to explosion. Uh, um, in fact, it might be you know, an upper limit. Uh, so less than two days, here for a two, around two days, and for a 1B peculiar, a little more than two days. So we really are succeeding in, in, in what we're set out to do. So the next, you know, the thing to come online is, is the Vera Rubin telescope. Uh, and, um, you know, is a top priority in the 2010 decadal survey and talked about a lot in 2020 de decadal survey. And as you all probably know, it's a legacy survey to run for a decade, scan the whole sky down to 24th magnitude. Um, and that means it will see supernova out to a redshift of about one. Um, but the cadence of uh, LSST uh, prevents, presents unique challenges for supernovae. And so POISE actually will provide the training set for machine learning identifications uh, that will go into interpreting uh, Vera Rubin uh, data. So let me move on to my next topic. Uh, Moving into space, uh, so in particular, JWST. So this collaboration, the uh, MIR snack, which I have trouble saying, uh, is a infrared supernova astrophysics collaboration. Uh, it's about 35 collaborators in total, but there's a core group of the five of us, uh, Peter Hufflick at Florida State, James Durkazy and Chris Saul at Virginia Tech, and Melissa Chavanday. At space telescope and me. <sighs> so to date, we've had three successful proposals, uh, two in cycle one, uh, one on type 1A and one on to obtain type two, um, a DD 
uh, a director's discretionary time proposal uh, to look at a very nearby type 1D that was just awarded. And, you know, in round numbers, we've gotten sort of about 1%, maybe a little less uh, of cycle one time. And the previous mid infrared spectra of supernova only were available from Spitzer. And their quality is is not fantastic. Um, it's it's not the level of, the, of JWST. We submitted five cycle two proposals. Uh, we'll hear the results on May tenth, um, and uh, they cover uh, spectra and photometry of all types of supernovae. So let me just turn to the one uh, JWST uh, spectrum that we analyzed, uh, and uh, this is. This is a JWST image. Uh, this galaxy was observed by the FANG survey, and uh, amateur Judy Schmidt uh, made this beautiful image. Uh, and here's our supernova, uh, supernova 2021 AEFX. It's a normal type 1A. It was a poise object. Um, it was obviously caught very early. It had extremely high velocities. Uh, the velocities were uh, at the edge of those known, around 40,000 kilometers a second. Um, there was a poised paper on uh, 2021 AEFX. Um, and uh, so let's talk about, well, what we can learn from 2021 AE, about 2021 AEFX. And so again, remember white dwarfs have this inverse mass radius relation. Um, so low mass white dwarfs have low central or big radii, low central densities, high mass white dwarfs, small radii, high central densities. And the nuclear physics just sort of tells you, well, what you'll make. So um, this diagram is sort of funny. Um, uh, it's a log diagram and zero corresponds to 10 to the eighth grams per cubic centimeter, so one corresponds to 10 to the ninth grams per cubic centimeter on this diagram. So at low densities, um, you make symmetric uh, nuclei, so equal number of protons and neutrons, so nickel 56. Um, well, that's great. Um, uh, but at higher densities, um, electron capture rate, so P plus E goes to N plus nu, uh, um, are sensitive uh, depend primarily on density. Uh, so you'll start to make neutron rich species like iron 54, um, which doesn't seem like it's uh, neutron rich, but it is um, uh, stable nickel, nickel 58, and uh, radioactive cobalt 57. Cobalt 57 has a, a long half life, uh, it's close to 300 days. Uh, whereas radioactive nickel 56 has a short half-life, it's, it's around six days. Okay, so here's our spectrum. Uh, this is obtained from with MIRI on the Space Telescope in uh, with the low resolution slit spectrograph. Um, and uh, what do we see? Uh, well, this is 323 days past maximum light, uh, and we see lots of forbidden nickel lights. And this big argon three forbidden line. This big biggest line is cobalt three forbidden line. It's a resonance line, uh, so it's very strong. Well, you know, nickel 56. I told you that you know. You need to make nickel. You need to make nickel to make the object to make a type one A supernova shine. But nickel fifty six, its half life is six days. Uh, so in three hundred and twenty three plus uh, days, uh, there's going to be a lot of e foldings, and you really don't expect any radioactive nickel fifty six to be around. So this nickel that we see has to be stable nickel. So this has to be nickel 58. So this tells us, again, going back to this white dwarf mass uh, central density diagram, this just rules out 
densities about uh, a, about you know two times ten to the eighth, which means it rules out progenitor masses below about one point two solar masses, because we've got to see some, got to make some stable nickel. So here's our explosion model again. We're a collaboration of theorists and, and observers. Um, and the light curve, this is the B-band light curve. It's really great for the first 40 days or so. Um, and uh, the nucleosynthetic products in the center where the densities are high, we make stable nickel. And then we're obviously the densities go down further out. So we make some radioactive nickel, which we need to. Otherwise, again, we don't have thermonuclear explosion. And then out at a velocity sort of around 9,000 kilometers a second, uh, we been, begin to make, this is, this is silicon, so we begin to make intermediate mass elements. So if we look more carefully and really analyze the profile, uh, we see this, this argon-3 profile. Uh, it's nearly a flat top profile, and that's not surprising. Uh, since, you know, go backwards, uh, you know, this the argon-3 is going to be made out here, and so it's going to be in a shell, and that's what you expect from a shell is a flat top profile, but it's not quite flat. It's actually, so we call it a tilted flat top. Um, and uh, if we look at that cobalt-3 resonance line, we can see now the velocity is much lower because the cobalt three is in with the stable nickel, so it's at low velocity towards the center at low velocity, and the argon is further out at higher velocities. Uh, the velocities of uh, supernova in general basically follow a Hubble law, so the velocity is proportional to the radius. Um, uh, so that's the velocity difference is perfectly understandable. But this, this tilted, um, uh, it's not, not flat, uh, is um, consistent with an off-center detonation. So the detonation occurs basically at a point um, out off-center. Off uh, and then, of course, you get uh, more intense burning closest to the detonation point. And, uh, uh, and so you will build up a somewhat asymmetric uh, 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 nucleosynthetic uh, distribution. And the result is, is that we're looking sort of around 30 degrees, uh, um, uh, actually sort of minus 30 degrees uh, from uh, where the uh, detonation occurs. So here's our full spectrum model. It does a pretty good job. Um, we played around a little bit with uh, whether there's electron capture mixing or, or not. Um, as I said, this burning is very messy. It's very turbulent. So you might expect that there would be some mixing. And you can see that we can't really say from this one spectrum, uh, um, you know, this, this feature sort of maybe says, yeah, want some mixing and, this one, maybe there's too much. Uh, so we're hoping with future observations to be able to sort of nail this down. So in the end, uh, for we really can put a central density on 21 AEFX. It's about 1.1 1, 1 .1 times 10 to the 9 grams per cubic centimeter. So it sort of falls here, kind of in the near, basically in the near Chandrasekhar mass progenitor. Now, like I said, this is one supernova. Other type 1As could be different than this, uh, but it is a firm result. Uh, so here we have uh, our MIRI MRS data, so mid-spectral resolution. This is it's an IFU. And uh, no one told us this, but didn't really know how to reduce the uh, um, IFU data from point sources. Uh, so we were the guinea pigs and it's taken us a while to uh, really uh, figure out how to do it. Um, 
so we have these two observations, this uh, 2022 XKQ at modest times uh, is a subluminous uh, type 1A. This is 21 AEFX at later times, but at higher resolution. And then uh, here's a type 2, uh, 22 uh, ACKO. Uh, and uh, this is uh, sort of early for us. Um, but one of the things that we want to look at is when CO forms in, in core collapse. Uh, and uh, you can, it's actually not really on this plot, but we don't see any CO. Um, uh, uh, so uh, we're hopeful that in our next observations, uh, we, we will see CO. So moving on to my third topic, uh, the Phoenix group. Uh, Vera is a postdoc in Tenerife in Spain. Um, our leader is Peter Hauschild in, in Hamburg, uh, Jason Oftenberg uh, at uh, Embry-Riddle. Uh, works on precision observations of sort of normal stars like Spica, Vega, and Travis Barman in, in LPL uh, works on irradiated planets and objects like that. Um, so Phoenix uh, has NLTE treatment of many ions and a detailed treatment of molecules. And I think that's, that's one of the things that really uh, sets us apart. And the other thing that really sets us apart is, is that we really are a generalized um, stellar atmosphere code. We really want to work on, you know, sort of all astrophysical objects, supernova, novae, uh, normal stars, cool stars, irradiated planets. Um, and um, by working on that broad range of, of astrophysical objects, it also helps us have um, faith that our approximations, and yes, we do have approximations, uh, um, that they really hold over, over a broad range of astrophysical super uh, uh, circumstances. So just quickly, um, I'll show you there's some results. This is from a paper by James Durkesey when he was my student, um, looking at uh, sort of the first poise object it, way before poise, but um, this object uh, 2011 FE, supernova 2011 FE is a normal type 1A supernova. It's very nearby, it's in the Whirlpool galaxy. Um, and it was discovered by PTF, which is the precursor to ZTF um, about 11 hours after explosion. And uh, so there's very good data. This is obviously an HST. Uh, um, uh, spectrum. And uh, what James was able to show, the really interesting things that James was able to show was by you need, because this is a blend and actually all of these things are blends. I mean, the UV region is very rich and, uh, um, uh, and uh, complex. And there's actually a lot of information. I actually have a, a ATP project uh, on uh, UV region. Um, uh, but he was able to show this high excitation, so carbon-4, um, uh, yeah, I'm going to try to finish up, um, and uh, silicon-4. So let's see, let me move along. Um, but uh, here is um, something that maybe is uh, more close to home. Uh, so this is a paper by Sarah Peacock, or led by Sarah Peacock, Travis Barman's student. Uh, now she's now a postdoc at Goddard. Um, and uh, what she showed is, is that um, actually the Lyman alpha profiles that Phoenix predicts are like the black line. Uh, so really no, no, uh, no central flux but observed in many systems is something like more like this blue or purple line uh, where there really is a fair amount of, of, of uh, central. There's, so there's a reversal of the profile. And uh, what she showed is, is that um, that has to do with uh, what the departure coefficients in the Balmer uh, 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 levels are uh, and uh, that by changing them, and she just changed them by hand, 
uh, um, you can get to something like the observed profiles. And then she showed that um, it does have effects. So at high, um, uh, uh, high up in the atmosphere, uh, there's some depletion of like methane, oxygen, OH, uh, and a uh, little less, less effects in, it, in the anoxic case. So um, uh, we're uh, in the process of releasing our next uh, uh, stellar atmospheres grid. We released quite a few, the uh, uh, next gen grid, the ACES grid, and the, new, the next one is the new era grid. And uh, so we have a new improved equation of state, which we call SESM, uh, better and more atomic collisional data, which is important, uh, 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 particularly in cool stars for uh, uh, determining the balance, NLTE, LTE balance, uh, new line lists, better wavelength sampling that goes out and includes the JWST region, numerous bug fixes, but like all codes, there's still plenty of bugs in there. And so here's just a taste. Um, so this is, uh, you know, for a sol solar type star uh, at the solar metallicities, but three different temperatures from 2,500 to 10,000 degrees for T effective. And you can see that UV region, very rich line blanketing in the UV region, the optical, and then the JWST region. And there you can see the CO fundamental. So just to conclude, POIDS provides information on progenitor and explosion mechanism. Mearsmack, mere snack uh, provides information on explosion, nucleosynthesis, progenitor mass, and dust formation. And Phoenix ties it all together and brings a broad range of products of use to broader, the broader astrophysics community. So thanks. Hey, hey, Eddie. Yep. Oh, yeah, since no one's chimed in yet, I have kind of a big picture cosmological question. So I was struck by actually the diversity in your supernova zoo. And I'm wondering, you know, given the importance to cosmology and the accelerated expansion of the universe for uh, the calibration of type uh, 1A supernovae, um, how, how confident you are you in the um, uh, their use as really good standard candles? And do you see that changing with these, <laughs> with all these new observations that you're now able to make in composition and 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 everything? So fortunately for the Nobel Prize winners, I don't think they'll take their Nobel Prize away. Uh, no, 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 no. And, I, <laughs> and, and they shouldn't. No, no, they shouldn't. <laughs> But no, no, I, I mean, I'm, I'm being a bit facetious, but no. So, I mean, we're pretty, when we use, um, uh, so, uh, and, and I didn't even mention it, but but uh, uh, thermonuclear supernova also have somewhat of a zoo. Uh, um, uh, but luckily, we're able to um, observationally, empirically isolate um, uh, which ones are uh, the ones we call the so-called core normals. Uh, uh, by a a, a a spectroscopic cut, so it's empirical, and the the you know the relationship that we use to determine the luminosity is purely empirical. At, you know, at this time, I mean, it has some theoretical basis. Uh, I mean, it's 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 uh, basic understanding as well, and uh, you know. Uh, foundations are well understood, but you know, since we don't have the model of a Type One A supernova, we can't, from first principles, uh, 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 predict that that empirical relation. But but by you know making cuts and um, uh, uh, you know restricting ourselves to uh, uh, sub samples of Type One As, I'm not so worried. Now you know the the Hubble tension uh, may you know drive one to be a bit worried about um, uh, uh, Type One As, but the feeling in the community is is it's it's not the Type One As that are the problem. It's it's the Cepheids or the tip of the red giant branch, or it, it, it's the calibration of the 
uh, of the further down the distance ladder. So, so, um, uh, so I, I think we're on fairly solid ground, but you know, things could shift around. But, but we're, we're on pretty solid ground that the composition of the universe is more than 70% dark energy. <laughs> yeah, we are. We are. I mean, I think we're, we're, we're on solid ground. Uh, there. It, it, it's pretty hard to shake it. <laughs> Thanks. Eddie, I was wondering the, uh, uh, one of your early diagrams showing the, the type one uh, supernova explosion, pushing away that other star. Uh, uh, you know, I, I'm wondering about for both novas and, and, and now that we're finding all these thousands of solar systems out there, I don't know if any are in association, uh, except for perhaps the original discovery of some, some uh, 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 planetary bodies orbiting you know, white dwarf, dwarf, but if there's, uh, uh, might be other, you know, examples of, of, of post nova, post supernova uh, solar systems uh, out there. And, and, uh, and I'm wondering uh, about the ability to uh, calculate uh, just, just what kind of uh, force, you know, might, might be operating on objects orbiting uh, 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 stars at different distances, uh, uh, um, you know, for, for both, you know, nova and supernova type situations. Was, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you remember, but, you know, one of the very first exoplanet systems was a pulsar. <laughs> um, uh, right. And, uh, uh, you know, back then I was, I don't know, more, well, I was a lot younger and more cavalier. I was like, nah, it's wrong. It's wrong. But, you know, it's held up. Uh, 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 so, you know, I think that, um, uh, you know, uh, these binary systems can survive more than, you know, we might naively expect. And, and uh, you know, that's the sort of thing that Nate calculates uh, um, and uh, 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 so you know I don't think anybody's really looked at it in detail but it's it's certainly something that that is is right for for uh, study yeah yeah I I, well, I, I, I actually uh, 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 measured uh, Nova sig 75 uh, 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 before I, I, I caught the peak of the of the of the Nova there you know uh, and and I, I always wonder gee if there if there was a you know solar system there what 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 would this, this have done locally so <laughs> yeah. Yeah, not any any not anything good for the people there but <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah 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 well or, or even just how much of a uh uh of an effect is it you know uh uh you know it's like uh, the Martian, you know, with the storms on Mars. Okay, that's not really what storms would feel like on Mars, and 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 I wonder what uh, just how you know nasty uh, uh, various kinds of novas might be on on a on a planetary body. Uh, you know, is it is it truly nasty, or is it just uh, you know uh, you know you, you use some uh, sunblock? Uh, yes, <laughs> I think it's it's for the atmosphere. It's pretty truly nasty in general, um, but. For, for the body itself, maybe not. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, interesting stuff. Yeah, I, I think there's just all kinds of doors that are opening up now that, that uh, uh, to wonder these kinds of questions, which were previously addressed primarily in science fiction novels. <laughs> oh. uh, yeah, good stuff. Anybody else have any questions for Eddie? Actually, yeah, I had a, just a quick question. Um, I was... Uh, interested in the in that uh, asymmetric uh, the nucleosynthetic distribution that asymmetric uh, velocity yeah um, uh, plot you had um, I guess there's been other measurements of that too right and maybe you can I, I'd be interested if you if there's like a a spread um, and there's kind of a you know maybe a, a typical off-center um spot you know if there's a some statistics on how far how far off center they they tend to originate from um so uh um uh and i'm trying to recall exactly where uh, uh it, it uh occurs in our model i think it's it's about um uh two tenths of a solar mass uh enclosed uh um but uh um there hasn't i mean the the thing is, is that the JW is, I mean, there has been uh, uh, other observations that have somewhat shown uh, these 
tilted or call them pot bellied profiles. Uh, um, so there has been some uh, indication that this has existed. But the beauty of the mid infrared is, is that the lines are way less blended. So uh, you have much cleaner uh, line profiles. And, and so you can really, you know, dig into, I mean, you know, what we obtained, the, you know, the amount of information we obtained from one spectrum uh, is, is really pretty amazing. Uh, and, and that really speaks to, to the value of, of moving into the mid infrared where you have these much cleaner, you know, much more well separated lines. And so you can really do sort of more simple line diagnostics and, and be confident about, uh, about your conclusions. <clears throat> Okay, so it's a an advertisement for for your for your work and getting more data like that, right? Yeah, exactly. Great, that's very exciting. I I, I really uh, enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions for Eddie? <laughs> Clap hands. Hey, well, Eddie, thank you very much. It, it was a real pleasure listening to you. You know, a, a, a different subject, but uh, one that I, I think is very useful. Yep. Well, I, I hope to talk to you more. Great. Thank you.